Well, welcome. Welcome. If you could please take your seats and there's some chow over here, please uh, come and enjoy. Um, so I'm David DeCoste from the Markle Center for Applied Ethics and really delighted to welcome you today to this Ethics at Noon conversation in the Jesuit tradition, reflections for a time of broken discourse with Father Mark Revisa of the Society of Jesus. Um, this program today is part of the Ethics Center's year-long initiative, a project on freedom of speech and civil discourse. We've had many events already this year. This event will have many more actually in the spring quarter and invite you to please attend those. Um, we're so deeply grateful to Father Revisa for being with us today, an old friend of many of ours here. Um, we sadly don't see quite as much, but we always love seeing him and hearing from him. Um, Father Revisa has been a professor of philosophy here at Santa Clara University. Um, he more recently, uh, uh, since that time, also founded um, a Casa Solidaridad in Manila, um, in the Philippines, and then since then has returned to the United States um, where he is working in uh, formation for the Society of Jesus, working on uh, the education that is given to Jesuits in the course of their training and studies. Um, he served as a delegate to the last general congregation of the Jesuits in Rome, and he has uh, recently uh, been appointed um, to be a general counselor to the new Father General of the Society of Jesus. So, Father Revisa, I'm sad to say we're going to be losing him to Rome, so we can all go visit him in Rome um, <laughs> and all and see him there. But um, it's always great to hear what is on his mind, and this is a time in our country, especially on our campus, of really a time of broken, difficult discourse, and it's wonderful to have an opportunity to reflect on what the tradition of St. Ignatius brings and for us, there's no better person than Father Revisa to help us into that conversation. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, and uh, thanks for coming out on such a nice day. <laughs> As I was looking at the rain this morning, I thought it'd be David and I here. So it's it's really wonderful to see so many really old friends. Um, I'm taking my lead today, as I often do on these occasions. The campus ministry staff will take will tell you from uh, one of my favorite philosophers, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who says that the job of a philosopher is to assemble reminders for a particular occasion, and and I think that's uh, apropos because uh, we all know how to have conversations, uh, and so it's really my task today to just remind us a little bit of some of those things we know in our heart but perhaps in our busyness uh, forget. And you know the irony is that although we all are good conversationalists, uh, we live in a time uh, really of broken discourse. Uh, we seem to be having a hard time talking to one another, dividing into camps. And um, I'm not going to bore you by rehearsing uh, analyses for how we've gotten here. I suspect we all have been reading about those. Um, but rather I'd like to have, invite us to take a step back um, and reflect on sort of the process of having conversations. Because my sense is that these sorts of divisions in a way are simply a more dramatic manifestation of some of the ways that we always have trouble talking to one another. Uh, and to make that point, uh, I want to show you a little clip from a Woody Allen film, uh, Match Point. Uh, and what I'd like you to do as you watch the film is to just note how many times in this brief conversation someone touches upon something that's potentially deeply personal. And if anyone would just listen and invite them, the whole conversation could go to a much deeper place. I think the old ones are beautiful. Ah. Yeah, I like the old ones, but Tom likes all those new ones with the gadgets, and I want an Aston Martin. I drove an Aston Martin. Really? Yeah, I used to work, 
would come in and I used to wash his cars for him. He was very, very particular about taking care of them, so I had to wash them every day with a toothbrush. <laughs> I want an Aston Martin or one of those vintage convertible Mercedes. Well, when we're married, we'll collect vintage cars, just as long as I can have a DB9 with all the trim, okay? In fact, Headley is perfect for keeping all those cars. In fact, speaking of Headley... Should we order, because he's waiting. Oh, thank you, sorry. I'll, I'll have baked potatoes with chuckles. That'll be lovely. Yum, yum. I'd like the same, please. Nothing to start. Oh, I think the wine list. I'll have the caviar beans, please. Uh, roast chicken? Go, boring. <laughs> Honestly, they have the greatest caviar beans here. You should try them. That's okay. No, do you like caviar? So-so. <laughs> He's been brought up as a good boy to always order modestly. I'm very sorry. <laughs> He'll have the blini. My goodness, was your father an oil rigger who specialised in etiquette? Uh, he was kind of austere. Chris's dad was a bit of a religious fanatic. Oh, Christ. After he lost both his legs, he found Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Sorry, but it doesn't seem like a fair dream. <laughs> <laughs> what were you saying about Edley? Oh, Papa's invited us for some shooting. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So I better bring a different change of clothes. I don't think your mother appreciated what I brought last time. I think that was your swimsuit. She's just used to slightly more fabric. I'm sure if she knew you'd worn it in a movie, she'd suddenly find it chic. True. Mm. Have you done many movies? It was a commercial, not a movie. But your eyes went straight to it, if you know what I mean. I don't think my career has really gone as planned. Oh, you just need a break. I think it's important to be lucky in anything. Well, I don't believe in luck, I believe in hard work. Mm. Oh, hard work is mandatory, but I think everybody's afraid to admit what a big part luck plays. I mean, it seems scientists are confirming more and more that all existence is here by blind chance. No purpose, no design. Well, I don't care, I love every minute of it. And I envy you for it. What was it the, uh, the vicar used to say? Despair is the path of least resistance. <laughs> it was something odd, wasn't it? it was very I think that faith is the path of least resistance. Oh, God. Oh, oh God. God. Can we change the subject, please? No, I was talking about acting, which is mm. much more interesting. No, I was just saying that I think I'm giving acting a second thought. Just can't bear people in my hometown to think I failed. Not that I'm ever going back to Colorado. Ever. Have you decided on a wine? Tea bottles are pulling you much shame. Thank you. I suspect we've all been at those sorts of conversations, right? Um, and what's tragic, really, is so many moments invite us to go to someplace deeper. Relationship with our parents, loss, struggles in a career, What's the purpose of life? And yet we just stay on the surface. You may recall that the former general of the Society of Jesus, Father Nicholas, said that one of the key challenges of our time is that we are suffering from a globalization of superficiality. And, and this is emblematic uh, of the times that we live in where we want quick answers, we want instant coffee, we're not patient enough to really sit and go deeper. And that can find itself manifested in how we talk to one another. In response to that, Father Nicholas said that, uh, in particular, Jesuit universities had a role to play to promote creative new ways of really cultivating a depth of thought and imagination that are distinguishing marks of the Ignatian tradition. Um, and I think, you know, we all know what it's like to go to a deeper place. And one of the best ways to cultivate that depth of thought and imagination in the academy is really through conversation. Uh, let me play a clip from uh, a wonderful conversation that uh, Krista Tippett had with the poet John O'Donohue. Uh, and he's inviting Krista to just think about uh, having a great conversation. The question is, when is the last time that you had a great conversation? A conversation which wasn't just two intersecting monologues, which is what passes for conversation a lot in this culture. But when had you last a great conversation in which 
you overheard yourself saying things that you never knew you knew, mm. that you heard yourself receiving from somebody words that absolutely found places within you that you thought you had lost, and a sense of an event of a conversation that brought the two of you onto a different plane. And then fourthly, a conversation that continued to sing in your mind for weeks afterwards, you know? And I've, I've had some of them recently, and it's just absolutely amazing. They're, like as we'd say at home, they're food and drink for the soul, you know? Right. Let me just highlight a couple points that John O'Donohue's making. That, that a great conversation, in contrast to this dinner party we just saw, is not a set of intersecting monologues. But it has a different kind of quality, almost a quality of receiving, where we, we overhear ourselves saying things that we never knew, that something new is emerging, that we hear ourselves receiving from somebody words that absolutely find places within us that we thought we had lost, that it, it takes us to a different plane and that it somehow continues to, to sing in us, to live in us, for days and weeks after you. And I notice from your nodding heads, right, we all know what those kinds of conversations are like. And the question really is, why don't we have more of them? And what can we do to cultivate them? This was a central question for Ignatius. Uh, really, as uh, Jerome Nadal, one of the early a Jesuits and commentator on the constitutions and the society said that, that conversations were at the very origin of the founding of the Society of Jesus. It's, it's how Ignatius first gathered his companions. There we see Ignatius uh, talking to Francis Xavier, trying to convince him to, to live in a different way. Uh, and as a recent uh, <clears throat> study of uh, conversations uh, was going through, they found this great letter from Ignatius to his brother Martin. And he's talking about his time as a student in Paris. Uh, and I thought I would share it because we have a number of students here. And, and what Ignatius says is, I'm completely dedicating myself to my studies and to muchas conversaciones, mas no temporales, right? That I'm, I'm having a lot of conversations, but not worldly ones that I'm having a different kind, a, a sort of spiritual conversation. In an issue from Conversations magazine last year, uh, Michael Murphy uh, had a, a nice little article on conversations, and he put it this way. He said, really, that conversations are the pillar upon which Ignatian spirituality and the Jesuit way of proceeding is built. And, and I think that's no exaggeration, that this was one of Ignatius's key sort of apostolic techniques and he really wanted to train all of his companions in how to do this. Uh, and John O'Malley gives a great description of, of what that kind of conversation was like. He said, Ignatius required that one approach individuals with love and a desire for their well-being while carefully observing each person's temperament and character. Um, I want to try to uh, give you an example of what that conversation uh, might look like. And I'm going to make some apologies. This is a, a film on the life of Ignatius made by uh, some of my uh, Jesuit friends in the Philippines. So it's, it's not Academy Award acting. <laughs> but what I'd like you to do as you watch it is to look more, not so much for the acting, but for the dynamic of the conversation. What is, what is Ignatius doing? And where this is taking place is it's in Ignatius's life where he's just recovering from being injured. He's been convalescing. And he's beginning to think that he could live a different way. And his brothers are quite worried about this. So they take him out for an evening to a brothel that he used to frequent when he was uh, in his wayward days. And he's kind of trying to change his life at this point. Please, please. I do not wish to. Are you all right, my lord? Let us just, please, 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 just... Mm -hmm. Sit and be quiet, all right? Let my brothers finish and, and then we can leave. I'll tell you the same. <coughs> so you've been doing this long? 
Long enough. Hmm. You were my third customer back in the day, my lord, if you remember. Uh, do they treat you well here? Better than at home, I can't complain. At home? My father was a drunkard, my mother was a slut. They beat me, both of them. I have forgotten most of it. Oh, I'm sorry about that. It must have been hard. It got better after my father died. When I moved here, I had nothing on my feet. Now I have a bit of money saved. I make dresses. Mm. You make these dresses? Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> One day I go off and become a seamstress or something. Something respectful. My dream. And why not now? Why not now? Yes. Yeah, why not now? Are you alright? Yes, yes, my lord. Sorry. Well, don't be sorry. <laughs> you are the first person I have spoken to in a long time who does not want me to get naked and then leave. I don't know if I can live this life. So we see this young Ignatius kind of stumbling into how does he want to have this type of conversation to go deeper. And remember that description that we just looked at from John O'Malley, to approach someone with love and a desire for their well-being and to kind of observe each person's temperament and character. And out of this, uh, if you think of that scene, you see three kind of key characteristics of Ignatian conversations. And the first is that sort of great Ignatian quality of accommodation. That, that the spirit is always working, life is always present. And so we don't have to sort of show up with an agenda. Rather, what we have to do is accommodate ourselves to what's actually happening in the person's life. So you see Ignatius just trying to find out, how do I meet the person on her own terms? Um, secondly, to have a quality of humility in the conversation. This key of to listen first and to speak slowly. To kind of from the beginning not presume that you have any idea what the conversation actually might be about or what might be percolating in the other's heart. All you know is that there's something valuable and precious there. And what you want to do is to humbly enter into it and begin to uncover it. And finally, to see the conversation as not about me, but to set aside that ego. There's that great moment where she kind of says, you know, you were my third customer. And you could see he, he could take offense and he's able to just kind of like, all right. But to say, is there something more here? To focus on what is that good that is emerging? Accommodation, humility, and seeking the other's good, these characteristics of Ignatian conversation. Um, and they come out of something that Ignatius later said was like the primary presupposition that he puts at the beginning of the spiritual exercises. And I'd like to just read it uh, for, for you um, and to think of it as like the bedrock that we begin all conversations from. He says we should always be more eager to put a good interpretation on a neighbor's statement than to condemn it. And further, if one cannot interpret it favorably, one should ask how the other means it. And if that meaning's wrong, one should correct the person with love. And if that's not enough, one should search out every appropriate means through which, by understanding the statement in a good way, it may be saved. 
uh, if, for those of you who may have uh, read uh, Gadamer's Truth and Method, his beautiful account of hermeneutics, it's very much, uh, it's almost as if Gadamer stole this from Ignatius. He, he has this idea that whenever we encounter the other, we should never first take a stance of judgment. And, and think how different that is from what we see on the internet or on MSNBC or Fox News. We, we never first presume that my job is to judge. But my job, first of all, is to approach the person presuming that there's some good here, that, th that she has some truth to say. And if I can't understand it, the problem is me. And so the first thing I need to do is to try to, in every possible way, interpret it so there's something that's reasonable, true, valuable. And it's only by taking that humble stance presuming goodwill and presuming that there's some good in the person and some good in what he's saying, that I actually can revise my own prejudices and prejudgments. And it's only after I've taken every possible step to say, well, wait a minute, no, I still can't make sense of it, that I can then offer with generosity and love, maybe what you're saying doesn't make sense. And then together we try to move to a more adequate understanding of the truth or of interpretation. Ignatius uh, solidified this in a wonderful letter that he sent to the Jesuits who were going to the Council of Trent. And as you may recall, that was a very fractious council. People were arguing a lot. And so Ignatius, when he sent his uh, companions there, he said, I'm going to give you some advice on how to talk to people. And I'd like to just read through it because it's, it's fantastic advice. The first one is, he says, be slow to speak. Be considerate and kind, especially when it comes to deciding on matters under discussion or about to be discussed in the council. Secondly, and notice he repeats, be slow to speak. And only after having first listened quietly so that you may understand the meanings, leanings, and wishes of those who do speak. And then you will better know when to speak and when to be silent. I invite you all, next time you're in a, a, a kind of heated conversation, to just imagine you're at Trent. <laughs> be slow to speak. Listen quietly to really understand what the other is saying. And he says, when those or other matters are under discussion, I should consider the reasons on both sides without showing any attachment to my own opinion. It's this incredible Ignatian freedom and indifference. I can be wrong. I don't need to kind of sally forth as a victor. But can I really consider both sides? And then he says, if the matters being discussed are of such a nature that you cannot or ought not to be silent. So notice there is a time to speak. He says, give your opinion with the greatest possible humanity, um, um, po possible humility and sincerity. And uh, later in the letter, he says, you, as you say something, you say, well, of course, I could be wrong. <laughs> of course, I, I might be wrong. And then lastly, the, the other one I wanted to take from this letter is he says, forget about my own leisure or lack of time. That is my own convenience. I should rather accommodate myself to the convenience of him with whom I am to deal. In other words, be generous enough to give conversations the time they need. How often, because we're so busy, we don't give the other that space to actually say what she needs to say. Give conversations the time they need to go deep. Um, I want to give you a clip of what that kind of looks like. Uh, this comes from uh, the film The Hours, and it does have some Academy Award acting. <laughs> um, and, and what you will see in this scene is, uh, and a little bit of background, it tells a story of, of Richard, a poet, um, who was dying of AIDS, and he's just won this literary award, and on the day that he won the award, he uh, kills himself. And his friend, lifetime friend, former lover, Meryl Streep, Clarissa Vaughn, uh, is shattered by this. And a huge part of Richard's problem is that when he was a boy, his mother abandoned him. And he could never kind of recover from that. Um, and it always affected how he could give himself in love. And so Clarissa has this profound hatred of Richard's mother, who she's never met and who has been out of the picture for years. But when Richard dies, she 
tries to contact the mother and, and she shows up on, on the night they were supposed to be having a huge party for him to celebrate his literary award, uh, but instead they're uh, mourning his death. And I want you to just watch as Clarissa Vaughn first greets the mother. This great look of judgment by Meryl Streep. We didn't speak often. And you can just feel her just, I am quietly judging you. Mm. you know? And it's at the end of this horrible day. She's lost her friend. She just wants to go to bed. And it's almost as if she's read Ignatius's letter to the fathers at the Council of Trent. <laughs> she just sort of creates this space for this broken woman to talk. And I'm going to kind of skip forward to later in the conversation where she's invited her to sit down and, and they're talking about her son's writing. He had me die in the novel. I, I, I know why he did that. It hurt, of course. I can't pretend it didn't hurt. I know why he did it. <laughs> you loved Richard when he was a child. I left both my children. I abandoned them. They say it's the worst thing a mother can do. Yes. <laughs> but I never met Julia's father. You so wanted a child. Right. You're a lucky woman. There are times when you don't belong and you think you're going to kill yourself. Once I went to a hotel. Later that night, I made a plan. The plan was I would leave my family when my second child was born. That's what I did. I got up one morning, made breakfast, went to the bus stop, got on the bus. Note. I got a job in a library in Canada. It would be wonderful to say you regretted it. It would be easy. What does it mean? What does it mean to regret? 
when you have no choice. what you can bear. There it is. No one's going to forgive me. It was death. I chose life. It was death, I chose life. Oftentimes when we think about conversations, our first thought is about what are we going to say. And I think one of the key insights of Ignatius is that great conversations are actually oftentimes much less about what we are going to say and much more about the quality of being, of presence that we bring to the conversation. Be slow to speak. Listen first. To create a space where someone can actually speak about that life that's trying to emerge in them. There's all, if you watch the clip again, and I hope you might watch the movie sometime, you'll see there's all these moments where Meryl Streep could have jumped in, could have passed judgment, but instead she just lingers long enough where this broken woman can begin to try to tell her story. And what happens to Meryl Streep is as she goes deeper, this person who she had dismissed all her life suddenly becomes real and complex, and things are suddenly not so clear. There's a huge difference between being present and available and just listening attentively. I've been struggling with this cough for eight weeks. I went to the doctor the other day and and was a wonderful doctor, listened very attentively to me, all of my little symptoms, but I didn't really feel like she was present to me. Do you know that feeling? I felt like I was a little specimen she was analyzing. As, as, you know, in contrast, talking to a good Jesuit friend where I was just whining. (laughs) And I just felt this person had, had done nothing but just made this huge space in his heart where he could hold everything I was saying. And and so we might ask ourselves, when we listen, are we available and are we present? Or are we just listening attentively? Especially for faculty when we're pressured and tired, the easiest thing is to listen attentively. But not to create that space that says, I have as much time as you need for this conversation. Um, If we now stopped right there, I think we could say Ignatius had some great practical tips, good suggestions for conversations. But he was actually up to something far more radical. And it's this part of Ignatius's conversations that we oftentimes give less attention to. And I want to try to end by focusing on what this looks like. What I'd like you to do is to, to reflect a little bit on how we listen and where our attention goes. When we have those conversations that are intersecting monologues, oftentimes what we're primarily doing, if we think about it, is we're focusing on ourselves. What am I going to say next? The other is simply a cue for me to launch into self-expression. And we're all very good at self-expression. And so that's why we have dinner parties like the one that we saw in the Woody Allen film. Or we have (laughs) arguments where it just seems like I am just waiting for you to stop talking so I can tell you how wrong you are. (laughs) In contrast, what we see in the hours is a kind of constructed shared dialogue. And, And the focus there is on how can we be present and available? How do we create this space where the other person can begin to share and articulate what's really moving. It's the beginning of what John Don O'Donohue was calling a great conversation. But there's actually uh, something more. When John O'Donohue's talking, notice he says, a great conversation is one in which you overheard yourself saying things that you never knew you knew. And before I continue, I just want you to see if you can get in touch with a memory of when you had one of those conversations where something really new emerged, 
Or you might almost say, if you're of a religious inclination, it was a moment of grace, that something holy happened, something that needed to be reverent. Ignatius had this idea that grace was always at work. For Ignatius, God, his image of God is a God who's always laboring. And so for Ignatius, the spirit is always at work. And he felt that the spirit was always speaking directly to each person. If only we would take time to listen. He says, it's more appropriate and far better that the creator and Lord himself should communicate himself to the, to the devout soul, embracing it in love and praise. We ought not to lean or incline in either direction, but rather allow the creator to deal immediately with the creature and the creature with its creator. This is advice that Ignatius gives his companions when he's telling them how to do spiritual direction. Notice his point. Don't you tell them what to do. Encourage them to listen directly to that spirit that's moving within them. I want to return to that film and pick up uh, the conversation that Ignatius is having uh, with Anna. Uh, and, and what's happened here in the conversation is as she's talked and she's kind of said, like, I can't leave this life, even though there's something compelling about thinking, like, why not now? And so Ignatius, because he's in his sort of first throes of conversion, is so zealous, he says, I want to share with you something that I've been doing while I've been recovering. And he says, here's a chair. I want you to just imagine that Jesus is in the chair. And he starts leading her through an Ignatian contemplation. And at first, this poor woman is like, you want me to do what? <laughs> imagine that there's somebody in the chair. Talk, and she's struggling, and he just kind of keeps encouraging her, like, no, try it. And I'm going to pick up the conversation where here she's trying to describe them. She says, Something, something's happening. I can't imagine it. Oops, I'm sorry. He's looking at me like he's been doing it for my life. And what is he saying to you? That he understands me. That he loves me. He does not care what I mean. He just cares where I'm going. <sighs> now, I want to try to pick up from that film. It just makes something very explicit that I think happens much more subtly. Um, we certainly have moments like that in spiritual direction. But what I want to focus on is on the structure of how they're listening. You might think what's happening here is that instead of just a shared dialogue where I'm listening intently to Victor and Victor's listening to me and we're each trying to express ourselves, what we're creating is a kind of receptive trialogue where now as we listen to each other, we're also listening to something larger, a spirit that's trying to speak. In the film, it's quite explicit. They're like, looking at a chair, <laughs> right? But it's a sense of like there is something in the conversation that's trying to speak through us. Martin Buber, the great Jewish philosopher, talked about between every I and thou is the eternal thou that's also trying to speak. And what happens when we can not just be present and available to one another, but to kind of intentionally and explicitly direct our focus to that larger life that's trying to live in us? If you're kind of a Jesuit like myself with my priestly piety, I would say we are listening to Jesus Christ. <laughs> if you're not of that persuasion, you might say, I'm just trying to listen, as Parker Palmer might say, to that life that wants to live in me. Or I'm trying to listen to that, that life or that freedom that's trying to emerge. In the Ignatian imagination, our God always wants two things for us, more life and more freedom. And that's always trying to emerge. Uh, and so as we're listening, 
what we're really trying to do is to create a clearing in which that new life, that new spirit can be disclosed. If any of you are familiar with the later Heidegger, he talks about Dasein as creating a clearing in which being can be disclosed. It's, the, it's what our work is to do. And in a similar way, what we're trying to do in these conversations is to think that there's something bigger afoot. We're not just expressing ideas to one another, but we're trying to let something new and larger and life-giving emerge. When I was in the novitiate, I can remember early on, it was my first month, and someone told me, Mark, whenever you listen to somebody pray, and it took me years to understand what that meant. Initially, I thought I was supposed to be like, as I'm talking to Lulu, I'm praying. I was like, I can't listen to her and pray at the same time. And then I had all these kinds of... But what I finally realized the person was saying is as I'm listening to the other person, I'm intentionally and explicitly becoming aware of that larger grace that's with us. And how is that trying to be expressed, to move? in what is happening in the conversation. And this happens in all kinds of uh, ordinary sorts of ways. I want to uh, give you one story. This is a story from my time in the Philippines. And we were sending our students out to this community. It's a community of street vendors. Uh, and in particular, it's the story of uh, this uh, good friend of mine, Willie, who's there on the, the left. And Tatai Furman and his wife, Nanai Thelma, really kind of became his adopted family. And Furman uh, sells this stuff called taho. It's a kind of custard, so you have to carry these heavy pails that you see there uh, through the streets of Manila. It's really hard work. And, uh, and then you, they kind of sell this custard to, to kids. And so Willie, who you see is a, a big man, he went out to sell with Furman. And on this particular day, they had sold for eight hours. And at, in the heat of the day, and at the end of the eight hours after they paid for kind of the raw material, they had made about $2 which really was not enough to feed the family that night. And they l basically live day to day. And so as Willie realized that tonight they probably just have white rice with a little bit of fish sauce, he just started moving into a dark space. And it brought up for him actually memories of his own childhood when he oftentimes went hungry. And he just started feeling like, how can you believe in anything? How can you sort of invest in this world that breaks our heart? And Furman, who was just a reader of souls, he, he saw Willie and he could tell this guy needs some help. And so he, he said, you know, Willie, what we need to do is we need to go to my uh, Filipino prayer club, my charismatic prayer group. And Willie was telling me as he was telling me the story, he goes, I'm, Father, I am not a religious man. And the last thing I wanted to do was go to a Tagalog charismatic prayer group where I couldn't understand most. But he said, you know, I do whatever Tatai Furman tells me to do. So they went. And they had, had this, and after, the, after the, the prayer, they went over to some family's house for dinner. I'm going to let Willie tell the rest of the story. So we, I step into this lady's house, and then I open up the door, and I just see like a whole bunch of people, like 13, like middle-aged Filipinos, just sitting around laughing. There's food everywhere, and they're like, come in, come in, eat, eat. And so I'm super excited, so I just start like munching and like mingling and stuff. So when we leave, uh, we're walking down the street, him, uh, me, Tai Tai Furman, and his, and his wife, like I'm in Tama, and so we're, just, we're walking down the street, it's like, like 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night, and then and he just grabs my hand, like just casually, like, we're just walking down the street, he's just holding my hand, and then Nana Thelma on my other side, she grabs my hand too, and we're just like walking down the street, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is like the most magical night ever. And then so, um, and then so when we get to his house, um, we're standing outside and I'm just, I'm just telling him, like, this is, this is a, a great night. Like tonight was so beautiful. Just thank, thank you so much. And, um, and then he just like, he just kind of smiles and looks at me. And then he like puts his hand on me. Almost, almost like, almost like, you've been living in America all this time. You haven't figured this out. And he just looks at me and he's like, oh, every night. It's a great story, right? And as, as Willie was telling it to me, and he told it pretty much like that, you know, and kind of ends with this line, every night is beautiful. And it was just the beginning of one of those great conversations. Because suddenly what we're talking about is, you know, why is every night here beautiful? And, and in the midst of like so much struggle and so much suffering and pollution and heat, we were both kind of like struggling to pay attention to what is the beauty here. 
And why is it that Tatai Furman can see that beauty every night and you and I, Willie, are struggling to see it? And can you see that there was a moment where we just had this, created this clearing where both of us were contemplatively listening to beauty, contemplatively listening to what is this thing that we are both trying to express? Why is every night beautiful? And how is it the people here are so in touch with it? And what's happening to us as we talk about it? It was, as John O'Donohue says, one of those conversations that wasn't just an intersecting monologue. We weren't just sort of exchanging lines, but it brought us both to a different plane. And it continued to sing in my heart for weeks. And it only happened because we both were not just trying to say what we already knew, but we were collectively grappling with what is that grace that's trying to emerge here in the guise of beauty. Do you have a sense of what I'm talking about? What I'd like to do in closing is to talk a little bit about how do we have more of these kinds of conversations. Uh, and this is particularly important to me now uh, because we had a, a general congregation about a year and a half ago, elected a new general. And one of the themes of that conversation was the need for us to rekindle and reclaim our own Ignatian way of having conversation and doing communal discernment. Uh, it's completely changing the way that we're doing business at the highest levels of the society. And I'd be happy to talk about what that looks like. But we're, we're really trying not just to sort of like pray in the morning and then come into the office and talk about things, but to have these sorts of Ignatian conversations guide us throughout the day. Uh, and, and there's uh, ways that we can adapt that technique to life here at Santa Clara. And, I'm, and with this I will close. You need two skills to do it, and I'm speaking here particularly to our students that are present. The first skill is to be able to speak intentionally. You know, oftentimes when we talk, you know people, they just go on and on and on and on and on. You're kind of like, can you get to the point? <laughs> but if you think of what Willie was saying, he, got, he was able in like a minute and a half, to say exactly what's the fruit that's burning in my heart. When we speak intentionally, what we try to do is, is get to what is that thing that's so important for me to share with you. It's seeing conversation as gift giving. And what is the gift that I have to share? The second skill is a kind of contemplative listening. It's the way we listen when we do direction with somebody. So what I'm doing when I'm listening is I'm not just listening to what Victor's saying or not just listening to the content of what he's saying, but I'm listening to a sense of what not only is what he's saying, but how is it moving in me? Do you know that sense that where am I being consoled? Where does my heart leap as he's talking? Where do, what am I feeling as I listen to him as an indication of what he's feeling? And at the same time, what is that larger life that's trying to live in him? So it's, it's not easy to contemplatively listen because you have to listen to the words, kind of pay attention to what's happening here. What is this larger life that's coming? But when we do that, it's amazing. And there's a simple technique that you can use uh, to do it. Uh, and I'll give you an example. How I just did this with a group of uh, students out at John Carroll. So they were all students that had been on immersion trips or doing service trips. Uh, and what I asked them to do was simply to take some time in silence and to journal and to get in touch with one of those moments when they really felt that there was new life trying to live in them. You know that feeling where they just felt like, this is why we came. This is why we showed up. Uh, they took some time to did that about and you have to give people time. So we gave them about a half hour. We don't have enough time in silence. So we really spent time in silence. And then I asked them to come together in round one. And we just went around the sort of small groups, about eight people, and literally just go around the circle. And each person briefly shares the fruit of what came out of their time of silence as a gift. No, about two minutes each, that's all. Then you have a little more silence to kind of reflect on what's happened. And then in the second round, what you're doing is you're sharing now in a conversational way what moved me as I listened in round one. So do you see what we're doing? In round one, we're contemplatively listening. We're saying what consoles me, what moves me as I listen 
to my companions. In round two, what I'm doing is I'm echoing back to the group. How am I being moved by what all of us shared? One of the students said, I wish I could have conversations like this every day. <laughs> so I never, another one said, I never felt so free. Right? To be able to not feel like I have to be focused on what am I going to share next in the circle, but just to listen. You know, another student said, this is the way I feel like we've always meant to talk. And what they noticed as they went in this round three, I mean in this round two, is that they began to go to a much deeper place. It wasn't just a sharing of stories, but now it was a way in which how all of these stories are moving us. And you can even go to a third round where we then begin to reflect collectively as we listen to how we're being consoled on what's emerging. Is there something that's kind of surfacing for the group? So this can be really fascinating to do if you're trying to make a decision or reach a, a consensus. Uh, so I want to stop there. We have about 10 minutes for uh, questions. Um, thank you very much, and I hope we can, although we can't have a, probably a great conversation here, we might have the beginning of one, so thanks a lot. Yeah, Tom. Thank you for an awesome presentation, Mark. I uh, really appreciate it. It's just wonderful. If, you know, you'd make a great therapist if you're interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> um, two questions for you. Um, how, do you. How do you think you can do this best outside of sort of the Jesuit, uh, Jesuit higher education ghetto? You know, <coughs> how do you take it to the, kind of the, the godless secular <coughs> Yeah. Um, that may not really agree with some of the founding <laughs> principles of Ignatius. So if you have any advice about taking it on the road to the secular world. And then secondly, you're, you know, I wonder about sort of the lost art of home dinner parties, uh, which seems to be a prime place for some of these conversations to occur. Um, uh, not in a restaurant like you showed in the right. clip, where. Uh, but, the, but the home dinner party and whether we should offer a course here at Santa Clara. On how to home dinner party. Yeah, let me start with the home dinner party because I had done some work like this with some former students and they actually said, we want to have a, a, a dinner like this. And what really changed the dynamic is that we all intentionally agreed beforehand that we were going to try to do this sort of contemplative listening with one another to create that space, to speak slowly, <laughs> to listen first. And it was an amazing conversation. You know, and I think what happens is we can just get sloppy and lazy. We just sort of show up at each other's doorstep and then we're tired and we just sort of end up talking like the Woody Allen movie. You know, so it, it requires, I think, a little bit of intentionality. But once we do that, I think we know how to do it. In terms of your first question, which I think is a great one, I think there's a way that you could even take this kind of thing. You just need to strike that language of spirit. <laughs> but just to invite people to say, can you reflect on sort of what's happening inside you? Like in a therapeutic model, what, what's going on inside you? And like, is there something that's important in this context? So l let me give you an example. Like, let's say you're with a group who's trying to, to make a decision. And you could say, like, oh, what I really want you to pray with is, like, where we're heading with this decision. And as you think about it, what energizes you, what encourages you, what discourages you, and then bring that to the group. They could do that first round, and they can still listen to one another with that sense of, as I listen to everybody, this is what energizes me. This is what fills me with fear. And as they begin to get a sense of the group, where are we being collectively energized, they can even do, go to this third round and say, is there something that seems to have us moving in this direction? Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Yes. So I, I run the immersion program and we just had a retreat a few weeks ago and we talked a lot about the importance of dialogue. Um, and in my, in my assessment, it's really hard to ask folks, particularly folks who have experienced a lot of marginalization or oppression, to be in the position of act, not just active listening, but real presence to someone whose perspective is oppressive to a fundamental part of who they are. Um, and so I, I, I sensed a lot of pushback on the students who had, had that experience often to say, I'm done listening. Yeah. I'm done yeah, being patient. Yeah. Um, Thank you for asking. I need something that. sort of more, you know, sort of that aggressive reaction. Um, and so how do you recommend working with populations where 
you know, that have been stepped on often and, and might not be ready to be patient or compassionate towards a yeah. perspective that's really harmed them. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, it's such a great question. That's one of the reasons I showed the hours clip, you know, is because I think if we, you know, we can initially start by, I, what I need to do is judge you and scream at you, you know, and sometimes we need, before we try to do this kind of process, to give people a chance to vent. Um, like we did this at the congregation, uh, and before we did this process, people had a lot of hard feelings, and so we needed to have a process where people could just vent. So sometimes you need to do that first and then move to this. Other times, though, it's really important to begin with this, even though our first inclination is to vent, to begin with this. So like with a group I was doing with John Carroll, we had a similar dynamic. And what people said in reflecting was that what I loved about this was that it gave everybody a chance to speak. And we were all on the same playing field. And we all had to listen to one another first. And what was interesting is as I listened to one another and we went deeper, they suddenly seemed to be a lot different than the people that I just wanted to scream at. Because oftentimes the people we want to scream at are superficial stereotypes of the deep, rich, full person. And so this can be a way of giving everyone a space to talk that's equal and everyone a space, a chance to have to listen. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the value of the structure. Yeah. Father, I like the part you said about listening and prayer because I heard the reverse thing from Mother Teresa. I did some voluntary work in ah. India and she would have a prayer session to say, your prayer is just listening, don't talk too much. No? Ah. So I like the part that you said that because it goes both ways, I believe. Yeah, well, far be it from me to criticize Mother Teresa. <laughs> so I'm just going <laughs> to let that be. <laughs> yeah, David. Mark, thank you so much just for such a wonderful presentation. And you know, I'm thinking, um, and I see this applying in so many wonderful ways, um, I'm thinking of online discourse these days, you know, especially sort of barbed, very sharp um, stuff on one hand, also the fact um, that's connected to online discourse, but it certainly goes beyond that, of the presence of so much knowing falsity and conspiracy theorizing. It's just become so much a part of our discourse. And, I'm just wondering, like, if you've been thinking about that stuff at all in terms of this notion of kind of an Ignatian conversation and just wondering where your thoughts go on those matters. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think you point to a really hard problem because I think that that online, the trolling, the, it, it really is kind of even worse than the intersecting monologues. What it is is really intersecting judgments. Yes. And, and it's all taking place at that spot of, I don't even really know you but I'm passing judgment on you. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's why I think, you know, the, one of, there's a lot of different things, ways to respond. But I think one of the ways is to try to encourage these types of conversations among people who are very different on our campus so that I suddenly can begin to appreciate that the, the young Republican or the Black Lives Matter person is, is maybe a lot more complex than I, I think. Um, another thing is, you know, we have, and I did, had to cut it out of the talk, I didn't have enough time, but there's a whole rich Jesuit rhetorical tradition. We used to teach rhetoric for years, this kind of the art of the eloquencia perfecta. And one of the things that people would do there is they would have a kind of uh, disputaciones, where you would have to sort of collectively struggle with one another. And you would be forced to take a side and argue for it that you didn't agree with it. And the point was so that you collectively could move to a place where you get to a better position. I think some of those things, just teaching some of those skills of classic rhetoric and then applying that to social media could, could be a really interesting exercise. Yeah. Yes? I'm thinking perhaps we need a paradigm shift in, in our understanding of higher education to move away from analysis and evaluation as, as our goals and toward uh, understanding in the ways that you've talked about today. Yeah, that's a wonderful comment. What I might say is, uh, we, we need a shift. I, I want to continue to have analysis and those things, but to supplement it with a real understanding and to see that this is a kind of incredible tool towards depth of understanding that we often leave by the by. You know, oftentimes I think in our classes we focus on how do we help students to self-express, but we don't focus enough on how do we create structures for rich conversations in terms of creating how do we become listeners, how do we create presence, how do we collectively go to a deeper place? So instead we have people that are really good at self-expressing, but not so good at having a conversation. Finding fault. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? 
Yeah. Sorry for the second question. I'm just wondering, you referenced sort of a good analogy of the, you know, the young Republican and the Black Lives Matter. How do you get them at the same table? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bill. Bill. I, uh, yeah, I, a lot of what I'm going to say doesn't pertain to the spiritual aspect of what you're talking about. I had a very peculiar experience. I was on a cruise recently, and I have a sleep disorder, and I get up very early in the morning. And there was another fellow on the cruise who, I don't think he had a sleep disorder, but he just got up very early in the morning. And we met the first morning in the one place on the ship that served coffee at 5 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And we started talking about what a great time it was and how people who miss this time in the morning miss the best time of the day and they don't get things done because they're not up at five and so forth. We get to talking about his history on a fairly superficial level, which contrasted with my history on a fairly superficial level. And the next thing I knew, we were having a conversation at 5 o'clock every morning yeah. for two weeks. Mm -hmm. You could not imagine a person with a greater difference of perspective and history than mine. He was a four-star uh, Air Force general who had retired as the commander of NORAD years oh ago. And we never, <coughs> we never got to talking about overtly spiritual things. He wanted to explain who he was in terms of what he did, and I wanted to explain who I was in terms of what I did. And we were both eager to listen to each other because I thought what he did, although it didn't intersect with my life very sharply, was fascinating. And he, for some reason, thought ancient philosophy was fascinating. <laughs> and. All that was necessary for that conversation to occur was not even for e the other person to stop talking, because he didn't much. <laughs> you were a good listener. I, I, we were both good listeners because we both were, we both were interested in the other person's story. Yeah. And I think the situation that David was talking about, where we've made up our mind before the conversation starts what we think about such a person. I, I will, I'll just say this. This is an academic thing to say. I apologize to say it because it's just what you'd expect. Um, <laughs> this is one of the smartest guys I've ever met. Um, his theme was that, that if you want to understand the problems of the world, you have to understand it in terms of the, the religion, culture, and history of, of the places that are having the problems. And he made it his business wherever he was posted to understand the religion culture mm. and history of the people that he was posted with. Yeah. It's a great example, though, and, I, and to go back to your question, I think Bill's really giving you part of an answer. It's always striking to me, and excuse the priestly piety, that Jesus, where he's always gathering people is table fellowship. You know, so if I were going to try to get the young Republicans and the Black Lives Matter together, I'd invite them over for dinner. You know, and like what we're going to just do is come together and break bread and this kind of thing. The second thing, I, in what Bill is saying that I think I, is just lovely, um, is you know Aristotle's idea that all people, by their very nature, desire to know. And if you look at little children, like they are just characterized by curiosity. And and so with those students, what I would really try to encourage them is, can we reclaim some of that wonder, some of that curiosity, just for tonight at this dinner? Um, and and to, to and I think in those spaces, amazing things can happen. Yeah. Um, there are several in the Gospels. There are some very robust conversations that have multiple um, interactions to them between Jesus and whoever he's talking to. The, one of the most complex is the woman at Jacob's well. Uh, yeah. Four. Um, and the fabric of that particular one, but there are others, and I wonder if you or you, you know of anyone who's actually broken those, not broken them up, but uh, explored them uh, for um, this kind of um, insight. Yeah, I love that, that story in John 4, and actually, I mean, I'm not a scripture scholar, so I don't know if anyone has written on but, but it's a perfect example of this way of Jesus sort of meeting the woman, accommodating where she's at, mm -hmm. leading her, listening to where she's going, challenging her. You know, one of the things Ignatius says is kind of go in their door and leave by yours. 
But he doesn't mean it in a manipulative way. He means it in like, where is the life that's trying to live in that person? And how do you help them get to it? So yeah, John 4 would be a perfect example of, I think Jesus was a great conversationalist, <laughs> you know? And just, and I think that's who Ignatius is trying to imitate, really, who we all are. Yeah. Please join me in thanking Mark. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming on a rainy day.